It's a beautiful morning in Nigeria and welcome to Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. Yes, I am super excited. We are super excited having you join us on the show this Monday morning. It's a Monday morning and it's a day that usually will begin the week, you know, with a lot of activities and a lot of things left undone. So it's an opportunity for you to go out there. My name is Ayuba Ilya. Thank you for joining us. This is the show where we bring you analysis and perspectives on all the stories making the headlines and all issues of national concern. Uh, try, to keep in, try to keep you abreast with uh, all the latest information that you need to know. And so, yes, today is another day uh, on the show. We are going to be looking at the conversation about anti-corruption and the new EFCC board and then, of course, looking at the rising insecurity uh, in the country. The show will also bring to you the dailies on Daybreak, uh, bringing perspectives on all the stories that made headlines on the front pages of our newspapers today on the show. But then, be before all of that, let's take a look at the news highlights. Beginning with uh, hundreds of villagers who flee Damari community in Berenimguari local government area of Kaduna State after dozens of bandits riding on motorcycles invaded the community on Sunday morning. Reports say that the bandits were in pursuit of members of a group loyal to a notorious warlord, Malam Abba, uh, whom the Kaduna State Police Command in 2020 confirmed to be a member of the terrorist group Boko Haram. According to reports, the bandits stormed the area on Sunday, adding that many began to flee on hearing the reverberation gunshots, reverberating gunshots, rather. Now, earlier, reports said that a deadly clash ensued on Friday between bandits and the lieutenants of Malam Abba, in uh, which several bandits were killed in the face of. Now, when contacted, Kaduna State Police Public Relations Officer ASP Mohammed Jaligi said that he has contacted the officer in charge of the area to liaise with other security agents in order to rescue the situation. Bandits' activities are persisting in Kaduna despite military operations ongoing in the state and other parts of the north to neutralize the criminals. And yes, other stories. President Mohammed Buhari has asked the military to respond fiercely to the abductions and killings by gunmen in Niger state. According to a statement issued by the presidential spokesperson, Garba Shehu, the president gave the order to the defense headquarters a few days ago as commander-in-chief of the nation's armed forces to set the ball rolling for a major military operations in Niger state, which has faced, which has faced continued attacks on its communities by bandits and remnants of Boko Haram terrorists fleeing theaters of war in the northwestern and northeastern parts of the country. According to the statement, the president asked the military to respond robustly to the cases of killings and kidnappings in the state and to give effect to the strategic objectives through the use of force. The president reiterated that security is a responsibility of every member of the community and only through solidarity and cooperation with law enforcement agencies can insecurity be defeated and commis uh, uh, commiserated with the government and people of Niger over the recent attacks in the state. Moving on, now Nigeria's crude oil valued at 1.64 trillion naira is exchanged for refined mot premium motor spirit, popularly called petrol. On the direct, under the direct sale uh, purchase arrangement from January to August 2021. The latest data from the Nigerian National Petroleum uh, Company Limited on DSDP cargoes that were swapped for refined petrol show that a total of 63.46 million barrels uh, of crude oil were used for the scheme during the period under review. The national oil firm said that in compliance with the Public Procurement Act 2007 and NNPC's policy and procedures, it had to engage qualified and credible companies in a direct sale of crude oil and direct purchase of petroleum products to ensure 
sustain product supply across the country. The scheme is introduced in 2016 to ensure adequate petrol import into the country and has been the sole importer of the commodity for over four years as other market marketers have avoided PMS imports because of the current realities in the nation's downstream sector. Well, that's that for the news highlights on Daybreak this morning. We'll be taking a look at now the events that made history in our world on this day, the 17th of January. Please take a look. Thank you for staying with us. You just watched uh, the Today in History segments on the show. I mean, we do this just to remind us of some of the significant, you know, facts that we know as far as our history uh, is concerned. Now, back in 1983, something happened. Yeah. Uh, Nigeria expelled two million illegal aliens, mostly Ghanaians. Uh, you recall the whole thing about Ghana must go? <laughs> You know, that became very popular. Until date, we have these bags that if you go to the market, it's called 
Ghana must go. I'm sure many people, uh, they've heard Ghana must go, but are not aware of how it all started and how it came, uh, you know, to be. But, yeah, it started from back then, as far, as back, back, far back as 1983, uh, where, you, you know, we had that history. Now, in 2017, Nigerian military mistakenly bombed refugee camp, killing more than 70 in Ran Borno State. Some of the misfortunes and some of the collateral damage. I mean, it's called, you know, uh, that Nigeria have to, you know, live with because, you know, sometimes really uh, in the process of going after the enemy, these things, they do happen. But um, we always, you know, ask and hope that we do not see frequent occurrence of these things. They could happen once in a while, but as much as possible, the collateral damage should be uh, reduced. And then back in 1946 uh, as well, well, before 1946, we also had this 1961 uh, Patrice Lumumba being murdered, you know, with the support from Western governments. Uh, we know him to be someone who is pro-Western. You know, he had this belief, he's pro-African, he has this belief in, you know, the African society, you know, rising up to, you know, be independent, you know, from colonial rule, from colonial influence and all of that. So, yes, that's his personality. Uh, back in 1946 as well, we had the United Nations Security Council met for the first time. Uh, very, very historical there. Today, the United Nations Security Council play very major role in, you know, solving global conflicts, uh, even though some experts will disagree, you know. But, yes, they are there. Uh, they are playing their part as much as global peace uh, is concerned. So these are some of the highlights, you know, of the events that happen uh, in times past. Now, we'll be taking a look at the paper review uh, already, and um, quite a number of papers we are looking at today, uh, beginning with the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, the lead story on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning uh, talks about leakages continue despite TSA implementation. It has the riders that says how agency heads uh, civil servants bypass system. FG sets up review committee. And then you also have why government should strengthen TSA. Uh, these are the riders to that story. The next one, uh, Buhari orders massive military operation in Niger. And then you also have hard times for tenants as landlords hike rent in Lagos. Well... That's a phenomenon uh, that is usually associated with January, isn't it? <laughs> you have also pomp as Machina Emirate holds cultural festival. Uh, the story below that uh, shows you shortage of lecturers, heats polytechnics. And then you also have the image there showing you the vice president there <laughs> tying his buckles, getting set to run. <laughs> According to the picture, it says, run, Osibajo, run. That's uh, stakeholders demanding. Well, very interesting uh, story there. Uh, well, we'll take a look at stories at the top, you know, of the paper. Hundreds flee as bandits attack Kaduna villages. Uh, that's on page four. And then the next one, insecurity. we we'll spent 100 million naira on ransom. Vigilantes, a Zamfara community, cries out. Tinubu. Huddles before a kingmaker are in the throne. And that's on page 13 of the Daily Trust uh, newspaper uh, this morning. Now let's take a look at other papers uh, today. The Nation newspaper leads with the story on politics as well. Uh, Buni, APC chiefs in crucial party on zoning uh, convention. The, they have it. And the next one, PDP, nobody can stampede us on presidential ticket. Uh, opposition governors meet. You'd also see uh, governor, government cuts gas price to Jankos. Uh, the pictorial there shows you the uh, presidential hopeful Asiwa Jubola Metinubu alongside the governor of uh, uh, Katsina State, Bello Masari, and uh, Senator uh, Kashim Shatima uh, there. Then below that also you'd find Buhari renews crackdown 
on bandits order to military. Uh, President writes Niger governors, a government on directive to defense headquarters, a gunmen on bikes sack Kaduna village. And then you see also Tinubu hopeful on end to insecurity. So you'd find details of that story uh, on the nation newspaper. And then the next one uh, we'll be looking at the Punch newspaper. Uh, there you have a number of stories. Uh, the lead story says fuel subsidy crisis. States kick as NMPC continues deductions. Uh, FAC meets uh, on Wednesday. That's uh, the details of that is on page two. And then you also have uh, deductions not justifiable, says Delta. Uh, you also see it's injustice against equity. That's the commissioner there saying uh, states, federal government may clash. Subsidy not under our control, says NNPC. Now, other stories at the very bottom of the Punch newspaper uh, says NDLA intercepts Kebi. Kano bound 1.5 million tramadol, seizes Lagos sports drugs, uh, Oshun prison, inmate's wife gives birth to triplets, family seeks help. PDP governors meet, decide on 2023 zoning to advise NWC. At the very top, insurance firms assets, uh, insurance firms assets hit 2.09 trillion naira amidst recapitalization suspension. And that's on page 19. The next one, Nigeria's debt stock hits 39.6 trillion naira in 11 months, according to reports. Uh, electoral bill takes front burners, burner as National Assembly resumes Tuesday 18. And then the next one, Nambi Kanu, Southeast governors, Igbo leaders to meet Buhari, insists on political solution. So... There you have it, uh, some of the lead stories on the Punch newspaper. Let's take a look at the Guardian newspaper this morning. Uh, there you'd see the lead story talking about power generation uh, in Nigeria. It says, Nigeria rations 2,500 megawatts over vandalization of gas fire plants. Uh, you'd see also Olorun Shogo, Shogo uh, Alaoji. Geregu Sapele Omotosho Ugeli plants heat. Uh, and then you also see Nigeria to cut metering gap by 50%, reduce tariff, uh, the presidency is saying. Review of privatization, liquidity crisis, experts canvas. So uh, these are some of the writers to the lead story. The next one says NCC alerts Nigerians to new ransomware attacking organizational networks. IPOP declares it at home tomorrow to back Kanu. 2023 presidency, Tinubu's declaration, implications for APC, PDP, and Southeast. And then the next one, hundreds of Kaduna residents flee as bandit attack. Conduct 2023 elections with new law, Jega tells Buhari. Uh, that's that for The Guardian. Uh, this morning and then let's take a look at this day newspaper as well uh, on this day farmers count gains of Anko Boros keep uh, to unveil mega rice pyramid yes so we are waiting that uh, you also see the next one 2.4 billion naira judgment debt Supreme Court reverses self restores GT banks appeal against innocent motors uh, the next one the lead story uh, talks about uh, with 4.56 trillion naira and cuberances, NNPC to shed toxic liabilities in 2022, says Kerry. The writer says company will be the largest capitalized, most profitable in Africa. Now let's take a look at the Blueprint newspaper. Uh, there you'd see the lead story says, nine days after Gazette on bandits. Uh, you see also uh, Buhari orders major military operations in Niger. And then uh, the writer says, terrorists kill 15 in Mashegu. Uh, we've paid over 200 million naira as ransom in three years. And that's according to Zamfara community. 
Buni hails Buhari, Lawan on improved security in Northeast. And then the next one says four federal universities, Lafayette students uh, regained freedom. Well, these are some of the stories uh, on page six of the Blueprint newspaper. The, the picture shows you also some of the troops, the troops of uh, 231 Battalion and 331 Artillery Regiment Sector 2 Joint Task Force. Uh, the, uh, the Northeast Operation had in case celebrating after repelling Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa province attacks on Bu, Borno State. Uh, also, a gun truck seized from the terrorists by troops there. And then below that, at the very bottom, NDLEA intercepts 1.5 million tramadol tablets, others en route to Kebi and Kano. So these are the stories on the front pages of our newspapers uh, today. To review these stories with me, I have in the studio the chair, editorial board, blueprint newspaper, Zainab Okino, uh, for the review. Good morning and welcome to the studio. Good morning. Yeah. Well, quite interesting, uh, interesting stories on the front pages this morning. We'll begin with the Blueprint newspaper uh, talking about the order, the marching order given by the president. I mean, this is not one, this is not the first of its kind, isn't it? Yeah. We've seen some of such, you know, orders multiple times and it's as if the words of the president are losing, you know, the weight that, that, that they should carry uh, and all of that. What do you think about it? <laughs> You've already said it. Yeah, the, the, well, the president has to do what he has to do. He has to give orders. But whether the orders are being carried out is another thing. It's now like a script. Whenever it happens, there's a script to it, which is you just check, if, uh, remove, edit a few things here and there, and then push it to the public. But I don't blame them. I think they are doing the best they can. It's just that. Uh, we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed by this uh, banditry, despite uh, renaming them terrorists. And again, maybe our military is also overwhelmed. They can't be everywhere. They are now in the civil populace, whereas they should just be the de defending the country. Then the, and I think I said it the last time I was here, that I think the government needs to do, to do more recruitment of uh, military personnel. Well, uh, but I sympathize with the people of uh, Nigeria State, and that as Zamfara, Sokoto, mm -hmm. to some extent, KB. I mean, it's sad. I mean, there's another story about, uh, I don't know whether you mentioned it, yeah. where Zamfara people have paid up to 100 million naira. That's sad. Mm -hmm. These are poor communities paying so much for their own freedom or their own safety, which cannot even be guaranteed. Because even after you have paid, you cannot guarantee your safety. Yeah. I mean, an example is the case of a father who was uh, kidnapped in Casino State, and he paid ransom. And his children put money together to pay ransom. Mm -hmm. And they had one of the, his son that took the money to the kidnappers. So how do we continue this way? In fact, we also saw a story as well where uh, someone who, you know, was to pay ransom to get his son back, have to remove the roof. Yeah, that's the one house, I'm referring to. You know, to sell, you know, yes. to be able to I raise mean, money to yes. rescue his it's son. It's so sad. It's such a, dr a tragedy that someone has to remove the roofs over his head and his family's head just to pay ransom. And do you know how much? 50,000. 50,000. I think the world must not hear this. Unfortunately, it's already there. Yeah. It's an embarrassment. It is. Really and that's the president's hometown, mm -hmm. home state. But you know, we keep saying that <laughs> our military is overwhelmed. Where do, you, where do we look to? I mean, they, it seems like they are, they are all we've got. You know, so uh, if our military is overwhelmed, what, what should we be doing you know, to be able to boost their capacity? I mentioned one. We need to. You no, know, it's not about capacity now. There's question of number and there's question of capacity. So question of number is what I spoke about. Capacity is a different story on, on, on its own. But for, for number, we need to recruit more. For capacity, what do you do? You train. 
But uh, it's still beyond that. What about facilities? What about equipment? But you know, the world is, it's not, it's not about, it should not be about the military alone. What about intelligence gathering? It's key to fighting any war. In fact, it's the most important. Should we be looking and at And I'm not saying they are not doing, mm. the, 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 those in the secret circle are not doing enough. They might be, but I don't well, know. We are not about, seeing the results. How about international support? Do, do, should we be looking at maybe getting some, I mean, we have the United Nations Security uh, Council, for instance, uh, you know, we have, you know, the Air Command, Nigeria itself has had to deploy its own security personnel and troops, you know, to other countries to fight and to keep peace and all of that. <laughs> Are we looking at that direction? I, do, I, have not, I have not read much about that. But I don't even think it's enough. We need to put our own house in order. Where, how many places will the UN forces be? Almost every part of the world, there's one crisis or the other, or one conflict or the other. And it's not always enough. Because you know how, how vast Nigeria is. How do they police the whole of the Northwest, the whole of the Northeast, and even some other pockets of places in the, in, in the country? It's a very dicey situation. There may be a comorg, and I don't know. And this, you have actually raised a point that nobody has been looking at, ECOMOG. Is it so difficult for us to raise forces through the ECOMOG to help Nigeria? Because we have to help ourselves. The world is, everybody is trying, if you don't help yourself, yourself, there's an extent that the UN can help you. So ECOMOG will not be a bad idea, but uh, I don't know. Nigeria's well, problem is much. A I, I, a, it's a lot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to do with. All right, well, let, let's take a look at other stories here. The, this morning, the Daily Trust newspaper leads with an interesting story that uh, talks about, uh, you know, the leaking, leakages that we still experience in the civil service, you know, despite the TSA. Uh, it says uh, leakages continue despite the TSA implementation. It talks about how agency heads, uh, civil servant, bypass the system and all of that. So it looks like all our efforts to fight corruption, uh, it's uh, being weakened, you know, by some of these things. <laughs> well, I read it too. Oh, I didn't read everything, but I have an idea what it's talking about. TSA was a good idea. I mean, when it came, when the idea came, uh, everybody was elated that for once we are going to have a measure of control once there's a single treasury account. Unlike what operated in the past where uh, MDAs were in, kind of independent, collecting their money and spending. So unfortunately, I don't know what went wrong, whether we are actually not teachable or we cannot really be, we are not serious about fighting corruption. Everything just went uh, haywire, and it's so depressing. It's so depressing because we hear things. This is like a confirmation of what people hear. You and I hear every day. Sometimes we think, ah, this, can be, this can't be true. How can somebody stay to billionaire? What will you do with it? How? How did you do it? But it's happening. It's happening. We are hearing it. And this is a confirmation that it's actually true. But why is why, why the government... Why, I mean, there's something about emotional capital that came with the Buhari government. Everybody was, everybody was like, let's wait, let's wait, because uh, Daniel has come to judgment. Mm. So this is the man that we've been waiting for to come and sanitize the system. And honestly, that time, you mind yourself, even on the road, mm. with, with uh, road safety, you, want to do, you just want to do the right thing. Mm. Mm. But how did we lose it? Because the government has not proved they, are not, they have not uh, met actions with uh, words. their words. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, because you know, now we hear of even government, those in government close to the, pre to the president mm. involved in corruption. And there's no concerted effort to ensure that they are either tried or at least uh, some kind of uh, investigation. Mm. And then you make the result known. Because it's not enough sometimes to, to even do secret investigation. Mm. If I don't use someone as an, as a deter, as an example to deter mm. others, it will continue. Sure. 
And that's our major problem in Nigeria. We don't enforce anything. We have plenty of laws now. We did. No, there's so, no. So, do you think that this is about the, you know, the the Buhari-led administration? You know, uh, yes, like you said, some of his, some of the close assistants, you know, and officials, you know, very close to him, and we've not seen enough will to say, okay, look, you are going to be charged, you know, and you are going to have to face the law. You know, instead, we've seen that people are just shown the way out, you know, quietly. You know, like we saw in the case of the former EFCC boss and all of that. So, or is it the process, is it the problem of the judicial system, which the president himself have complained about, you know, as being slow and frustrating, you know, and that it's very difficult to get justice, you know, and all of that. I, I hope Magu will not hear you because you are trying to make him uh, escape good. Magu had his own uh, defense. As a matter of fact, it, was, it looked as it were then, like a personality clash between him and the Minister of Justice. So it was not just about the man who is supposed to fight corruption being, being corrupt himself. It was like a clash of titans. And of course, the supervising minister had the, had, had the upper hand. So then judiciary, what about judiciary? Before a case gets to the judiciary, is it not? There has to be prosecution now. Who does that? The police. So, yes, yeah, judiciary may have their own, and you can only hold them accountable in cases of, uh, I mean, hold them responsible. Uh, some things have not been done where maybe on political uh, cases. But in other cases, how many cases have been taken to court that they have not done justice to? The point is that some of, most of these cases never get to even prosecution level. People sit on it. People, powerful people sit on it. They are if, more powerful than the president, are they? I don't want to say that, do you know how many governments we have in this government? There are many governments in, in government where it happens everywhere, but in this very one, there are many governments, there are people I won't say they are more powerful to, uh, than the president because if the pres president really wants to wield the big stick, he can do it. He can do it. But for political reasons, isn't it? Uh, perhaps. Uh, it's your words, so not be me. <laughs> so, but there are really powerful people who dictate the tools, who wield the big stick and decide how things should be done. Because when you think it matters most and you expect the president to act, he does not act. Mm. People act on his behalf. And those people acting on his behalf, in most cases, they put their own interest first. Maybe, that, maybe it will be now justifiable for some Nigerians to think that, look, the president has not demonstrated enough will. After all that have been said and done, you know, after all the change mantra, after all the anti-corruption crusade that we have seen, because yes, I mean, Nigerians are aware of these cabals. They are aware that there are these powerful people, uh, you know, in places of authority. Uh, yet, you know, Nigerians believe that the, the President Buhari is this, you know, no-nonsense president that will come and be brutal, you know, with people who are corrupt and all of that. And that's why they felt, well, he's a strong man. He can do the job. And well, so, to, be, to be fair to the President, government is not about one person. They go, one, one person can lead the way, leadership. You, you lead from the front. That's, that has, we have not seen that willpower in the president. And then that's why others, other things are falling uh, out of hand, kind of. So. All right, now let, let's take a look at... Uh, because this corruption thing is not something we can discuss in one week. True, true. <laughs> it's, it's a very lengthy discussion. All right. Uh, other stories on the front pages. The Guardian leads with the story, Nigeria rations 2,500 megawatts over vandalization of gas-fired plants. So, yes, we're dealing with, you know, while government tried to make, to make effort, <coughs> you know, on their part to generate more power, it looks like there are more hurdles that we have to deal with, you know, vandalization on one hand, and even the issue of this goes not being able to offtake, you know, what has been generated by the Genco. So uh, we seem to have just more than the problem of, you know, infrastructure here, isn't it? 
What this has shown me is that that means we are generating 2.5 currently. Is that not what it's saying? It's rationing. Yes. Rationing that 2.5 megawatts. Yes, because we are unable to uptake as much that has been generated due to vandalization. Yes. But why do we have, why do we elect people? Why do we, why, what's this, the use of this uh, yearly, uh, it, has, it is becoming a ritual every four, four years? To, we put people in charge of these places. I, the last I knew, uh, if I'm right, is the civil defense is in charge of this, these pipelines. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they are not doing enough, but perhaps there is collusion or there is sabotage somewhere. Otherwise, I mean, our last hope is gas because we know that uh, uh, petrol is, is in, in the next few years, it will go out of fashion, but at least gas will do, remain there. Mm -hmm. If it is vandalized today, the pipelines are vandalized to the extent that we can only produce, not produce, we can only generate, is it generation now, or no, distribute. distribute. We can only distribute mm. 2.5. It's sad, no wonder uh, there have been issues in the last few days. They, they, they have actually been rationing. Mm. Uh, so the thing is to do is to work on the root cause of the problem. How do you stop vandalization of these pipelines? So. Well, uh, it, it appears that the deployment of uh, our security, the NSDC, like you said, you know, may not be sufficient enough you know, to protect or to cover all the places that need, need to be covered. Again, the issue of numbers. Mm, the issue of numbers. But again, you know, the people who vandalize are powerful, powerful people. Though. They even do it in collusion with security people in most cases. You and I cannot go and vandalize any pipeline. We don't have the, I mean, we don't have the backing. Without the backing of some f strong security forces, you cannot do it. Because they are the ones that will show you the way. They are the ones that will, they are the ones to tell you when the road is clear and when the road is not clear. <laughs> so, uh, well, our problems are many. So maybe we should just go to another one and see what we can fix. <laughs> yes, so the lawmakers are going to be resuming today, uh, talking about the National Assembly, and then uh, basically to the issue of the electoral bill is on the front burner. Uh, before they went on recess, there was the you know, uh, refusal to give assets to the electoral bill, and the president had to send it back to the lawmakers you know, on the reasons that the, one of the issues in the bill about direct primaries, uh, the, the president expressed some reservations you know, about that. One of them, which is, he said, look, it's, it's uh, more like you, know, you are denying some people of their rights you know, to get to decide what mode you know, of uh, voting they want to adopt you know, to, to select you know, their leaders. And he also rests, raised issues about costing of the direct primaries and issues of insecurity you know, and all of that. What do you look forward to, you know, even as we, the lawmakers, resume? Okay, during the last uh, media chat or interview that the president had with uh, Janus and NTA, he emphasized that if the National Assembly will expunge that clause about direct primaries, he will sign it. That's what he said. Mm. So that's what I'm looking forward to because you know the National Assembly that we have, they do the biddings of the president. So I'm sure they are going to expunge it and they will give it to the president and I believe it will be signed. Mm -hmm. But what will not be there probably or expectedly is direct primaries. Direct primaries for me is not even a big issue, as good as it is. Whether the president signs it or not, for me, it's not a big issue. It's, the only problem is that if this, our, our true representatives, I mean the National Assembly member, the lawmakers, if they give the president, if they work on a bill and give the president to sign, I do not expect too much reservations on the part of the president. But then this has already happened. So what we should look forward to is for them to present a bill that the president likes. For them to for him to sign. Okay. 
and they, that will happen. It's about what the president is it about what the president likes? <laughs> oh no, let me talk more. <laughs> I'm not the one saying it. It's well, the it's the reality <laughs> of things as yes. we see as we see it today and as we know it now. All right, now we'll be taking a quick break and then when we come back we'll take a look at some more stories on our newspapers today. Please stay with us. <laughs> This is Daybreak on Trust Television, and here we've been looking at the stories that made the headlines of, on our newspapers uh, this morning, and I have in the studio the chair, editorial board, a blueprint newspaper, Zainab Okino, <coughs> and she's been giving us perspectives on some of the stories that we are looking at this morning on the front pages of our newspapers. Now, on the Punch newspaper, we ha have a story about Namde Kanu. Uh, Southeast governors, Igbo leaders to meet Buhari, insist on political solution as far as uh, <coughs> Namdi Kanu uh, <coughs> uh, discussion is concerned. The president in, the, in his last interview uh, said, well, the, the federal government is just merely giving Namdi Kanu an opportunity to come and, you know, defend himself and to, to speak up on some of the things that he's been saying away from Nigeria, you know, and so... <coughs> The issue of releasing him is a no-no. I mean, the president is, is, is just, his body language is already showing that. Now, he's not going to interfere with the judicial processes, you know, and all of that. Uh, what do you think about, you know, this story? Side of it, no. Which well, side of? Generally, whether, you know, the, the, the request by the Igbo leaders, you know, for the president to, to order the release of mm. Nandi Kanu is in line. I, 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 I wish the uh, Igbo elites, I wish they, they did not interve intervene this way. You know, it's supposed to be a legal and judicial case being turned into a political case now. And you know, when, you come, when it comes to politics, sentiments come in, divisiveness 
comes in, so many things come into the mix. So, but I, I, I'll, I'd rather go with the president that we should wait for the judicial process to take its, its course. But if the only reason why political solution may be, should be considered to some extent, is because of the insecurity that the Kano thing has elicited. The Kano, Kano issue has elicited so much insecurity, and the people that are suffering it are the ordinary poor people. Oh, of course, they, you see the merciless killings that are going on there. So on that basis, I can say, well, what do we do? Well, at the end of the day, we always come to the round table to so talk. So when, when, when we talk about political solutions, what mm. exactly you know, are we even looking at here? Uh, to say, okay, you've been forgiven, go ahead, go on and continue to and con and, and sin no more. <laughs> That's go it. Go on and sin no more. Sin or no just more. go on and just continue with your propaganda, you know, uh, or, or what exactly are we looking at? Here? So it is for the Igbos to tell us what's their idea of political solution. You get? They should tell us what their idea of political solution is because, like you said, is it that you should just go scot-free or... What, I, I mean, how can we silence him? You, I mean, he's an individual with all, all the rights due to him. You, if we cannot stop him from, t from talking, then you need to try him. There are some people who didn't even go as, as far as this, and they were tried in this country, found guilty and perhaps jailed. I think they should. The, the only thing is, let the federal government not get involved in the judicial process, allow it to take its course, and let's see what they come up with. And perhaps that time we cannot begin to talk about politics. Yeah, so, and, you know... Yeah, but he can be given soft landing. Mm. If you talk about the implication of this on, you know, others who mm. may, you know, think in the same line. I mean, we've seen the issue of Namde Kano, and then another one, Sunday Boho, you know, came into the <laughs> fore. And then, you know, only God knows who else will come up again. So if you took, think about the implication of this and you know the approach of government in treating these matters on the tendency to have others come up with you know some of such uh, agitation that's why the judicial process should be followed in the first instance for me it's about governance if there's an inclusive governance some of these dissenting voices will not come up yes there will always be agitations but the generality of the people will shut it up if there is an inclusive government, and everything is not politicized. I mean, who was uh, a colonel before the, this government came into being? It was a nobody, rabble rouser. So but because the government elevated him to a certain level, he now felt he was speaking for his people. And people began to believe in him. He, he, for me, he's, 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 uh, he's inconsequential, or he was inconsequential until the government made him consequential. So by having got to this level, the only way is, how do we get out of the mess? Just because of the lives of people that are involved. Otherwise, if it's about Kalu uh, Elu, I would say they should try him and possibly jail him. All right. Well, there has to be a way out. Mm -hmm. And let, what do they have on the table? Let the Igbos tell us, the Igbo leaders, I like the, the fact that they are intervening because there are people that are involved, and that's leadership. But let them put something on the table for us to, to look at. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's see another story. On the, on the Daily Trust newspaper, we have the story about you know, hard times for tenants as landlords hike rent in Lagos. And I am sure that in some other parts of the country, people are feeling the heat you know, as well. At a time like this, you know, we still see uh, increase not just in the in the cost of food, but general increase of items in the market and all of that, and even house rent now. Uh, is it time for us to begin to think of how to regulate how this, these things are being done? Because it's really going out of hand, you know, if you may. So what's the way out of this? Well, the way out of it, I'm not sure I can exactly tell you what it should be, but all I, all I know is that the fact that uh, landlords are increasing their rent, it's, it's a function of some other issues. You mentioned the prices of things, including cement. 
and all all items items used in in, in the building industry all of them have sky, skyrocketed some of them have tripled some have doubled so and these landlords they all go to the, we all go to the same market to buy things and uh, what their one era could give them before, even two naira will not give them now. So it's a cyclical thing. And the, the, the if government. if the gov if if prices of things are controlled from the top, from the fuel we consume, transportation, everything is controlled. You can as well force landlords to control their rent. But when everything is allowed to come down on the consumers. You and, you and I will surely be at the brunt. I mean, if we think about the consumers, uh, you know, they themselves are not finding it any funny. They Nobody are, is finding it funny. Are you finding it funny? Economy, <laughs> they are in the same system. And it's not like they are having, a, you know, like their income is, you know, changing or like, you know, increasing and all of that. So it, it becomes worrisome, really. It is. If you think about the implications of this. On because already we have a uh, housing deficit. How many people own their houses, in, even in this Abuja? How many people own their houses? So you just have to rent. And for it to go up like that, you, you need a good salary to be able to meet up. And how many people are collecting good salaries? Mm. So that's why I said it revolves. It's cyclical. It's, uh, it's a function of so many, things, so many other things, except you are saying we should go into the other problems that necessitated the, 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 the increase. By the, by the landlords, which again will take us far. So I just wish something could be done. All right. Unfortunately, I don't know uh, what can be done when all building materials are expensive. All right. Okay, well, other stories the, on the Daily Trust newspaper. The mm. last one uh, that we'll be looking at, you know, about shortages of lecturers in polytechnics. That's also another story that one wonders, I mean, <laughs> We are talking about how to make our education system more sufficient. Uh, so we have issues of strike actions on one hand as well, and then shortages of lecturers. So even the lecturers are not sufficient enough, you know, uh, and all of that. Hmm. How do we fix this? How do we fix it? We have serious problems in the education sector. Even universities, I think the last thing I read is that we don't have the ratio of students to, to lecturers is 30, 30 students per lecturer. As against in the West where you see five students to a lecturer. And that's why our universities are never, never ranked among the first 100, the first 100 or first 1,000 in the world. First 1,000. First 1,000 in the world. Because these are indices they take into consideration. What do we do when even our universities are borrowing lecturers for, for, the, for the sake of accreditation? They don't have enough. But they cannot employ. Right now, there's an embargo on employment. And I think the other day, there's an educational institution that was asking for, ask, appealing to the minister to leave the embargo because they are really uh, shut off staff. Is it a hospital? You know, these two things are very key, mm. hospital, health, and education. Mm. So we don't even have, we, we have not been employed. There's embargo on employment. Even the few we have in the universities, I'm still talking about universities. I've not even come to the polytechnic. Mm. The few we have in the universities are complaining. They are, not, they are already talking about strike again. They come down to the polytechnic, where and that one is technically oriented. That means you need more people in the STEM, you know STEM, science, technology, education, something, something like that. So those are people you need more. But you see, a university will will admit a, a lot of students, more than half of the students in the liberal arts. So where would the STEM teachers come from? For the polytechnic. This is the logic I want you to see. So we need to train more people in the sciences, in the technology field, and they are the ones that fit the, uh, uh, the, the polytechnics, unfortunately. I mean, and we have so many graduates 
that are looking for jobs, even me, as I speak to you now. My son is a first class graduate of chemistry. He doesn't have a job. And this, he fits, he can fit into the polytechnic. And I'm not the only one. There are so many people, even engineers, mm -hmm. who are out there, no jobs. And they are ready to teach. Mm -hmm. But they have not been given the opportunity. Not to talk about you know, the large number of you know, both you know, skilled people, lecturers and graduates who are flying out of the country you know, to seek for better means. You know. Because you cannot blame them. At the end of the day, it comes down to what you can put on the table for your family. It's not about grammar, it's not about lofty ideas, about patriotism, good enough. But if out of patriotism, nationalistic fervor, I cannot provide for my family. I cannot be speaking grammar when I come home at the end of the day. I have to. I have to provide. So and if I now have the opportunity, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying people should go out of the country. This brain drain has been there for years. But migration, you can never stop. But if your country can provide enough for you, I, I'd rather stay in Nigeria because I love this my country. And all these beautiful, nice, sweet, tasty foods that I eat here, yeah, I eat Igbo, I, Igbo food, mm -hmm. Hausa food, I eat Yoruba. So I feel accomplished at the end of the day when I've eaten here and there. And I'll go to Imbola and I'll start eating nonsense. Mm -hmm. So, well, not really nonsense, but at least not my food. So I know a lot of people would love to stay here. We live and die here, they say so. Mm. But for younger people, they, 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 some of them, they want to at least spend the first few years of their mm. uh, working lives when they are still strong to earn some more, more money and come back home. But some may never come back. True. Very unfortunate. Right. Well, thank you so much for coming on Daybreak today and uh, sharing your perspectives with us on some of these stories. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, we've been speaking with the chair, editorial board, Blueprint newspaper, Zainab Okino, uh, giving us perspectives on the stories that made the headlines uh, today. We'll go on a short break, and then when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on the program. Please stay with us. <laughs>
right, thank you for staying with us. This is Daybreak reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. And now we'll be talking about, you know, the order given by the president, you know, for the military to, you know, uh, go on and deal with the issues of banditry and other criminal elements in the country. And I have uh, in the studio Stephen Okore. Uh, now, insecurity in Nigeria took a different dimension in recent weeks when fighters suspected to be members of the Islamic State for West African province, ISWAP, attacked the Nigerian Army University campus for security and strategic studies in the in Buratai town, Biu local government area of Bruno State. Now, it was reported that two employees of the university were killed by the insurgents. Reports say that the insurgents overran the soldiers guarding the campus uh, who, after exhausting their bullets, reportedly took to their heels. And so we we'll bring in perspectives to this and more on this segment of the show. Uh, Stevie Okori, welcome to the studio and thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> now, quite a number of things. Um, we saw this video that went viral on social media of how, you know, Boko Haram members yes. brazenly, audaciously attacked, you know, a military, I will call it a military base because it's more like, it's more like one of it, uh, you know, that camp in, in view, uh, local government. And that happened, you know, just a few days before the Armed Forces Remembrance Day, you know, so that, you know, how would you respond, you know, to that timing, and, you know, and the attack itself? Yeah, you see, um, these daredevil guys, they, they like sending signal, you know, to the authority, the military, the government of the day, and all that. Uh, if you see when the president went to Bruno some couple of weeks ago, the day, it, I think the day before he got there or so, or the very day, they struck, you know, they, they tried to send message that that they are on ground. Whatever the government thinks they are doing or telling Nigerians that they are doing against them, you know, they just want to give that impression that the, the things that the government is saying is not uh, correct and that is why they keep doing what they are doing. And you see, uh, it, it, I feel so saddened when a military base or institution like that is being attacked by these uh, uh, miscreants, you know. It still goes to show that uh, they are telling us, those of us that are ordinary civilians, you know, that uh, uh, we are not it before them. If they can, you know, go to strike in such a, a place that is supposed to be protected and heavily armed, mm -hmm. you know. So they, they, even the military station is even a small place compared to where they have gone to strike. They have gone to barracks, yeah, you know, well, so that's to show you the kind of... Uh, but, but is that not expected? I mean, situating a military school, you know, an institution like that. Yes. You know, in Bureau local government, northeast Nigeria, where we've been fighting this insurgency for quite a while now, yeah. is it not expected that you know at any time they could strike? And so, uh, what does it say about our level of you know preparedness, and, you know, being on guard? That's the point. And it, you know, each time I appear on the on the forums like this, I try to let uh, the audience, you know, know that there's need for uh, military to be proactive, you know. You see, I, I keep saying it that there's no need for them to be complacent, you know, because there's more to do, you know, uh, ahead, you know, than what they have achieved previously, you know. So there's need for them to be very proactive, to be responsive, you know, and be professional about what they are doing. You see, I feel very bitter when I heard that uh, they ran out of bullets when they were challenging uh, these uh, SWAP members. You know, such a news is not good to hear, you know. So they should be up to the task, you know, to see how they, they tackle such situation. Not running out of bullets or coming to tell us that they had more sophisticated weapons than, uh, than what our own uh, uh, agents, security agents are carrying, you know. So there is need for them to be proactive. Sometimes you look at them, they hang these guns as if they are handbags, you know. They are not professional in the way they, they are supposed to even position themselves. I took a trip out of Abuja, I came back yesterday. I saw some lapses in the, 
in our security agencies, that I, the agents that I saw on the road, both the military and the police, you know. You see them engaged in uh, talking to uh, Okada riders, forgetting that uh, one uh, criminal can come and pass with whatever he or she has in his car, you know. So they need to be professional. That's it. All right, now if you look at this and you look at the marching orders given by the president yes. just recently for the military to go ahead and crush yes. Yes. You know, bandits in the northwest and all of that, does it hold any weight for you? You see, for me, I don't think that uh, the president needs to give marching orders to the military to carry out such. It's their job. The Constitution already has mandated them. It has ordered them to carry out such tax against uh, criminal elements when they are uh, causing injuries on uh, innocent citizens that go about their lawful businesses. So for me, that, that marching order, I don't, I don't want to, I am not comfortable with that. You know, it's as if the, the Constitution does not even give them any power to do what they are doing. So until they wait for the president to give them marching orders, before they begin to carry out the job that they are started to do. When the service chiefs were sworn in, they, they, the constitution, they, you know, they came to the Senate, they were screened based on the constitution and others. So the constitution has already empowered them. Anybody that is saddled with any responsibility to see that Nigerians are safe and Nigeria is a secured state, they have the mandate of the constitution. So, so if the president does not give marching orders, wouldn't they go about their... Yeah, we've heard a lot of people blame the president that he does not give orders to you know, the military to deal with decisively with the bandits and all of that. We have heard people like that blame the president. You know, in fact, on Saturday we had one you know, that was insisting that, look, the president is not you know, giving them the orders that they need to go ahead and so they stand out and all that. Does, does that make sense? I, I think that they are just trying to blame the president, you know. Just the way I said, the Constitution already gives them the powers. You know, if you carry a gun as a military or a police officer to protect citizens of this country, and you see the enemies coming, will you stand and wait until the president gives you marching order to, sh uh, to fire or shoot? You don't need that anymore. You will already be given that powers to go ahead to do that task. So when I hear that kind of comments from uh, uh, people and saying that the president needs to give a marching order, for what again? When they've been mandated, it's clear in the act, either the constitution or the act that established them, their mandate is clear. So why do you need that for? So they just want to shift the blame to the president. But the fact is they should do what they are supposed to do because the constitution or the act that established them has already given them that mandate. Mm. All right, now this banditry, this payment of ransom is also another issue that is really raising concern. Uh, <coughs> residents in Zafra, uh, you know, are, are saying that look, over 100 million naira has been paid to bandits so far. Mm. Uh, do, do you see this as something reinforcing, you know, these bandits in the way they carry out attacks? You see, it's a quite unfortunate that um, money such as that, huge amount, are being paid by poor citizens to see that uh, they are safe and secured. But uh, if they, even at that, that they pay such an amount of money, are they still still in a, in a safe zone? Because if you pay to this set of bandits, another set comes. They will not take note of the fact that uh, you had already paid to. Uh, the previous uh, set of bandits that came to your community or their community, are they issued receipts? So, for me, paying such is that the government has failed in trying to see how to protect them. You know, so they are trying to source for another means of uh, protecting themselves. So they will be forced to pay such levies or ransom when they are kidnapped and all that. So I I think that they are in need in a quagmire situation. Citizens, you know, because you don't even know the next thing that will happen. You are very unsure of what's going to happen next. So they try to see how to prepare themselves against any unforeseen uh, situation. So it's quite unfortunate that uh, they pay such an amount of money. But what I think and I hope is that the government needs to see how to protect the uh, lives of uh, citizens and their property. 
Now, um, this is 2022, and uh, yes. we're approaching the general elections yes. uh, in a few months, uh, about 14, maybe 13 for 14 months, um, yes, months, yes. you know, to uh, the elections. And the conversations are getting louder. Do you think that, you know, with, with the whole discussions about politics, we are really paying attention, as we should, on these issues of insecurity in the country? Are we matching you know, our actions, you know, with the kind of reality that there is at the moment. Excuse me. Yeah, you, from the last point that you made, it's obvious and crystal clear that we are not paying attention. And with this uh, forthcoming election, of course, you know that attention will begin to shift, you know, because interest of politicians matters to them most than even citizens that they are there to either make laws on their behalf or govern them when in one political office or the other. But right now, you will see that attention has shifted from uh, protecting citizens. They are going about uh, consulting uh, major stakeholders in their various political parties and all that. But I think that the sectors that are supposed to manage the security of lives and property, they are not politicians, you know. Politicians, for me, I think that uh, at this point, they are supposed to see how to provide whatever or the resources that they need to get, you know, if for, for the security agencies to be able to carry out the tax of protecting lives of, uh, of uh, citizens. Because if the citizens are not alive, they won't be there to vote mm -hmm. for whoever that is aspiring for one political office or the other. So monies that are meant or is meant for the security agencies to take protect citizens and all that, for them to be alive to even vote, should be provided for them and released as I went you, you know. Because you see, I keep saying it, they, they, it to be on the paper that they have released, but it, it hasn't got into to them. You keep hearing the uh, complaining of uh, uh, shortage of funds, you know, even up to this morning, I was listening to the radio, they were complaining of shortage of funds, you know. So there's need for the government to provide what is meant for them. Mm. Then whatever they want to use to go and do their elections, yes. they can go ahead and do that. Well, but uh, I mean, we've heard countless times uh, yeah. how the security <coughs> chiefs will say, well, all that is needed to fight this have been provided. The president has given approval for every fund you know, that have been requested yes. you know, with respect to that. We've mm. also heard from the Minister of Finance as well, who have always said that, look, as far as insecurities or security is concerned in Nigeria, mm. they do not delay Yes. You know, disbursement for mm. you know issues of security and all that. So, uh, where is the missing link? I mean, if we are talking about you know l lack of ammunition, you know, by troops and all of that. You see, some of these statements can be political, politically made. You understand? It's possible that it is not the way they are saying it, but they want to say it just to keep their jobs. You know. I have given an instance of uh, the immediate past uh, chief of army staff where he came to, when he came to uh, the national assembly for when he was appointed as an ambassador. He said it there publicly that uh, uh, insurgency in the northeast it will take the next twenty years or more. But he didn't say that when he was chief of army staff. So some of these statements they they just say that of politics, you know, just to see that. Uh, uh, they keep their jobs. Well, you see, there's a difference between somebody in seven in the military or the police, statements that will come out of somebody's mouth, and when the person retires, you know, when the person retires, he begins to have the guts to say certain things. But once they are in power, or whenever they are in power, they don't say it, you know. So we should be able to say it when you are in power, you know, so that we will look at it, mm. you is, know. Is that, is that not going to amount to... Maybe it's a kind of insubordination or something like insubordination that. Insubordination at the expense of people, innocent people being killed and dying? For me, I don't think so. When you come out to truthfully say it, you know, uh, uh, very, some time ago there was this uh, Major General, there was a theater commander in uh, Operation Lafayette Adoli in uh, the Northeast there. Adeni. Adeni. You see, he, he, he was addressing the troops and he was being truthful. But what happened to him? He was being punished. So at what point will you now want to say the truth? The, the, the fact is that 
these realities are staring us at the face. Yes, we are seeing you know, it. You know what happened immediately that video went viral. I know. You know what happened? Yes, now. That's what I'm saying. They should be able to say it, you know, because it goes to the level or the point where we're talking about monitoring these releases, you know. Perhaps the money was released, it was diverted into private pockets. So the essence why the money was released wasn't implemented, it wasn't done. So the man was, was there and he saw that these things that he knew that monies were, were released for that and they did not buy, they did not go to purchase and the troops were complaining, you know. So these are the issues. We should be able to say it as it is. I think with that it will help us a lot and it will go a long way. Not if, if you look at the military, they have this, you know, codes and this principles of not, you know, divulging. Exactly. You know, or expressing themselves the way I, yes. you know, that they should and all that. So how practical is it? But is it helping us? It is not even helping us at all. So, you see, when it, it, the fact of the matter is that it is only just uh, civilians that these people kill. You know, we have seen where uh, one, one of these major generals was traveling to uh, somewhere about you, so he went through just some years ago that he was killed and dropped inside a well. You know, we have seen a, a former provost marshal that was killed on Lokoja Abuja Road. We have seen uh, the other one that, that was killed recently in uh, that northeast region. A lot of them. So they are also being killed. So whatever they are doing to set the pace, to do what is right, it is also going to help them. It is not just for us alone. So there is need for us to, for them to come out to say exactly this is what it is. Not diverting these funds and they're using it for their own uh, private uh, uh, use, you know. So that's my take on that. All right, well, we'll take a quick break now, and then when we come back, we'll continue the discussion on the program. Yeah. Stay with us. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us. This is Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. And uh, we are discussing security in the country. The president has given orders for massive military operations in Niger State. And also other stories about you know, displacement of communities and residents in Kaduna who are fleeing you know, in hundreds and all of that. So that's a concern really that we are looking at. We have in the studio Stephen Okori a security expert uh, giving us uh, analysis on 
some of these recent happenings. Now, uh, we've, we've talked about, you know, the role that vigilantes and local communities can play in augmenting all the efforts of our security officials. Uh, in particular, the governor of Katsina State have been uh, very, very uh, insistent on this. You know, he has urged you know, communities to defend themselves uh, and all of that. Are we matching words with action when it comes to uh, institutionalizing or kind of giving that a structure to be able to play out you know, in dealing with this security situation that we're talking about? Um, the governors are trying their best in that regard. Just the way you talked about the Katsina governor, Niger too, is doing the same. And uh, even Benue governor, they create such group and give it a name, you know. But I think they need uh, the federal government support to do that, to, be, to see that it is uh, effectively their mandate is effectively carried out. What I mean is that the federal government needs to give uh, the vigilante group a, a national recognition. Because what you want to talk about fighting or managing insecurity in local communities, in our local communities, we need the support of the vigilante. So the state government and the federal government, they need to see how to collaborate you know, to see that certain laws are made to see how to give them the constitutional backing, you know. You see, these vigilantes, they live on uh, voluntary uh, donations from members of their communities, the ones that have something to spare, yeah. you know. <coughs> so these are the things that they live on. Yes, but, you know, if you talk about that, some will say, look, the governors, they get what they call security votes, yes. isn't it? Yes, yes. So, uh, what else? I mean, is that not enough to take care of such things? Which of the governors have come out to tell us how he spends his security vote? It's a challenge on them to come out to tell us how they spend their security votes. Because security votes, nobody account, they don't account, they are not supposed to account for it according to the law, the provision of the law. You know, if they tell you that they are finished spending that security vote in two weeks, that's it. You know, so nobody can come and challenge them to begin to see how to explain how they spent the security vote. But I think that with all these challenges that they have in their various states, the onus behoves on them to see how to genuinely spend uh, these security votes without uh, diverting it into personal use. Because the, the stories making the, the news is that uh, uh, they divert these security votes because they are not supposed to explain how they spent it. You know, so governors that have these security votes, they are supposed to genuinely utilize these votes into seeing that uh, their states are secured, citizens are protected, you know. But they keep telling you that uh, they keep shifting that uh, part of uh, the insecurity, how to manage it to the federal government. The security architecture in Nigeria is centralized, you know, it's the federal, the president that can give orders and all that. But I think that if they truly want to manage these local vigilantes that they are trying to see how to establish or create in their states and try to bring out these funds to support that project, it will go a long way, you know. Then one, by the time you merge it with the community policing model, you know, that uh, we went to borrow from America, you know, you see, when we go to borrow, we borrow and come and paste. It's forgetting that uh, as peculiar situation is different from where we have gone to borrow, you know. So when they, when they manage these things, you know, this vigilante community policing model with the police, if the, that approach is put together, we will get fantastic well, results. I mean, I mean these vigilantes, you know, what does it take to arm them, you know, with the right weapons that they will be able to augment, you know, the security personnel that we have? Some of them, they use shotguns you know, and all of that, Dane guns uh, and the rest of them. And some of them, they use the hunting guns, uh, guns that they are using, you know, to be able to, 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 to do this. So, and if you look at that, is that effective? You know, would it match the kind of weapons that the bandits and terrorists are coming with, you know, and all that. So, that's an area to look at, isn't it? What does it take to arm them? 
That was why I said there's a need for the federal government and the state government to come together to see how to put certain laws. If it means the National Assembly passing the laws that will enable the vigilante to carry weapons that will be more than what we just, you just read out, I think they're better for us. You see, the fact is all hands must be on deck. It is not about the military or the police or alone. Even civilians that are not even carrying guns, all of us, we have roles to play in this regard. You know, traditional rulers, the clergy, you know. When these people come to either the church or the mocks and all that, the pastor or the reverend father should know what to tell the people. The imam should know what to tell the people because it's from amongst these uh, people that uh, these uh, criminal elements go to harness people that they feel they can work with, you know, convince them to come and join them, you know. So that's where I think that the federal and the state needs to see how to put a law that will enable the vigilante to carry weapons that will be more than. What kind of law do we need? I thought we already have, uh, you know, some of these laws. I'm looking at laws that maybe that will uh, permit uh, the vigilante to carry weapons or arms that is more than just a, a, a hunting gun, you know, because these other uh, criminal elements, they come with what is more than a hunting gun. So it means that even if these uh, vigilantes are just there with these hunting guns, their impact will not be felt that much, you know, because by the time they exhaust whatever the hunting gun is carrying, they will, have, they will look for somewhere to hide. And that will give these uh, elements the opportunity to, to strike. You know, so I am looking at where it, it will, the law that will aid them to carry what will be more than just that hunting gun that they are carrying now, or just bow and arrows. You know, so that's the area I'm looking at it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, um, the president has also okay. spoken about you know the role of traditional rulers. Yeah. You know, in this fight against insecurity and mm -hmm. all of that. How much role, how, how, how much can the traditional rulers actually do, you know, in this fight? Uh, be before we begin to talk about the roles of traditional rulers, you see, if you remember the 1999 constitution, the roles of traditional rulers was expunged compared to the 1960 and 1963 constitution where they had a, a very robust role. It was stated clearly what they ought to do. So right now, you see traditional rulers, what they do is just mere advisory, let them do this, let them do that, and all that. So I would think that uh, uh, there's need for the government to see how to reintroduce the rules of traditional rulers into the current 1999 constitution as amended. You know, that will give them some kind of uh, uh, legal or constitutional uh, support or backing so that by the time they make certain statements uh, or comments, it goes to show that uh, they are relying on something, mm -hmm. you know, because you and I know that traditional rulers have critical roles to play, you know, because most of these uh, criminal elements, they are camps, they hibernate within these uh, communities mm -hmm. that we are talking about. So if you do that, then, you know, one will begin to think what would not happen to local government chairman, you know, and, uh, you know, some governors and all of that, you know, what's the line that needs to be separated? How do we demarcate the lines? in clearly spelling out what traditional rulers to do and what local government challenges will do in this context. There's nothing wrong with uh, uh, the institution, the traditional institution collaborating with the local government and that of, and the state. You know, traditional rulers have key roles in security and peace building. You know, you cannot take that away. Um, you know, there are domains. They have their, their, their people living with them. So if you, a traditional ruler wants to move a step further to see that his domain is protected, what is wrong with that? He just to draw the attention of the local government chairman. This is what I am thinking. I want to see that I do, you know. For me, I think that there's need for a close synergy, you know, between the relevant stakeholders and institutions to see that uh, uh, what we are experiencing today is try to see how they are reduced because it's not a tax that one institution or a sector can uh, mm -hmm. carry out. And if you yeah. have that in place, what would you do you know, with, security, uh, with uh, traditional rulers who themselves you know, are involved with you know, yes. they are, they are, aiding some uh, of these exact, bandits and exact. terrorists? 
That is exactly. That's where we we'll now go to the point where governors should not play politics when uh, appointing traditional rulers. They begin to look at it that uh, uh, either the traditional ruler is his personal friend or a friend to his friend or something. You know, so they now try to relegate, relegate due diligence, you know, and following the appropriate uh, process to see how to appoint a traditional ruler. There are some of them that are bad, but the government will not turn deaf ears into those uh, issues raised against uh, the traditional ruler, and they will just go ahead and appoint the person because the person is their friend. And you know, so it takes time for somebody to turn a new leaf, you know. So those things are habits that are in them. So the fact that they are traditional rulers, it doesn't exonerate them. They are human beings as well. So those things that, you know, that they were doing before they became traditional rulers, they want to play that. It happened in Oshun. It happened in uh, some, one other state in the north here where traditional rulers were aiding uh, kidnappers to see how to kidnap their own uh, subjects. You know, it's very disheartening, but the government needs to see how to do due diligence, not begin to whip sentiments or politics into institutions like that. You know, and try to see that uh, they will allow them some level of independence, you know, where they can voice out their, their hearts as traditional rulers. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll go to a quick break now again. And then when we come back, we'll continue uh, with the show by giving concluding thoughts, you know, to this issue. Please stay with us. <laughs> Thank you for staying. This is Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital in Abuja. Security, security, security. That's the conversation on the lips of virtually everyone. The issue is not abating. And so we have in the studio Stephen Okori, a security consultant and expert, speaking to us uh, and give us perspectives on this and how best to deal and manage with the issue of insecurity in the country. Now, we are going to be taking concluding thoughts on this subject. Um, with all that we've been saying, a lot of issues have been raised, not just today, but even in time past, as to how can we bridge the gaps that there are in, you know, in this fight against insecurity in the country. So in concluding your, your thoughts on the program today, uh, what are the you know, loopholes that you see, you've seen that need urgent you know, attention? It's okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, as we speak, Nigeria does not have a, a national security policy. What's the essence of the policy? It's a framework describing how a country uh, should provide security for the state and its citizens. What we have is a national security strategy. And of course, you know that. Uh, Policy comes before strategy. We went to borrow this model from the United States, and we forgot that the United States had their own national security policy in 1947. So if you don't have a policy, what are you strategizing? Exactly. That's the point. We don't have. So there's need for us to go back to the drawing board, develop our own 
indigenous national security policy. That the strategy, this is the second strategy that we have on board. The first one came during the former president, Gulag Jonathan. Current president has uh, reviewed it. It's a strategy that will drive the policy. What are the issues that the policy will address? What will it, how will it make a difference? This, this, the, the policy is, the, is now the base, the foundation, in trying to see how we provide security. It will make the, the security sectors very effective. It will clearly define what and what they ought to do. The strategy now is to provide guidelines to see how to achieve what is contained in the policy. But we have left that. We have left the questions and jumped to the answers. You are providing answers to which questions now? What are you providing answers for? When you have left the questions, you have failed to identify the questions. You know, so this is something that is not, is not known, but I think that we should draw the attention of uh, uh, the security agencies and the National Assembly, because it is it is a legislative process. It was passed through that legislation. So who is supposed to initiate that? Is it the lawmakers that will do that, or is it the executive that will do that? It's the executive that should do that, through the Office of the National Security Advisor. That is one. There is need for us to address that. It's very key. We should have just be jumping into strategies when we have not put a policy together to see how the strategy can drive the policy. Mm -hmm. So it's important that the government, the federal government should be aware of that. You know, then there's some other things that should follow suits, you know, like trying to see how uh, socioeconomic development, because you and I know that uh, poverty, unemployment are the root causes of major, major insecurity challenges that we're experiencing today. You know, good governance to see that people are provided with jobs. You know, we, the way we talk about, you know, poverty and employment, unemployment as some of the root causes of insecurity. Yes. In some of the developed countries in this world, that mm. they, ha they, they have people who are comfortable. Mm. We, we still have security issues, you know, and concerns. So, yes. in that sense, would we say that uh, this unemployment, poverty, uh, are some of the root causes, you know, of, of, or, or should we say they are solely the causes of the insecurity that we're dealing with. In other words, no matter what you do, yes. there will be, still there'll be, be crime. elements, criminal elements. Uh, yes, of will, course. You know, yes. disturb the peace of the, everyone, you know, and all of that. So how do we put it in proper context? Uh, uh, let me say by quoting Emily Duncan. Emily Duncan said that uh, it's not a, a society without crime is impossible. But having said that, it behoves on the government to see how the crime that they experience does not escalate to the level that we're experiencing. Even the countries that you're trying to mention, is it their crime rate, is it as high as what we're seeing in Nigeria? It's not as high as that, you know. So when you, the fact of the matter is that when you arrest these people, their confession is that they don't have jobs, they are unemployed, they need to eat, they need to do X, Y, Z. But the fact of the matter is that there are countries or there are citizens to here that are still poor, that are not, they are not carefully employed, but they are not involved in uh, acts of uh, criminality. Exactly. You understand? So, yeah, the ones that their intention is to do what they are doing, they are using those uh, uh, yastics as uh, reasons why they go into crime, you know. But uh, the major cry, when you engage people, they will say there's poverty, uh, people are unemployed. And, uh, how, there's need for this government to, to see how to educate. Education here is key too, you know. They should go to school, create environment where these people should go to school. When you go to school, that is when you will know, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I'm quite impressed with uh, what the armed forces uh, they, they are doing in terms of uh, the radio uh, station that they established, and even the police even established a radio station. Through this medium, you know, they can tell the people, sensitize them uh, why they should not go into crime, they need to, be, to live in peace and harmony and all that. Then they should extend these radio stations to, to for those not Abuja alone, to other states, so that they can communicate to these people in the language that they will understand, mm. you know. Well, language that they understand. I remember that phrase <laughs> landed us into trouble uh, yeah. some months ago. <laughs>
But uh, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the show and uh, sharing your thoughts with us uh, you. on the program. We look forward to having you. Thank you for inviting again. me again. Yes. Yeah. We've been speaking with Stephen Okori. He's a security consultant and experts here giving us perspectives on the rising threats of insecurity in the country. With that, we'll take a look at sports updates just before we round up the show. Take a look. World number one Novak Djokovic has lost his appeal against his visa cancellation by the Australian Minister of Immigration Alex Hawke on Sunday after three judges heard the appeal and unanimously dismissed Djokovic's appeal. With the visa cancellation, the humble star boarded a flight from Melbourne's Tullamine Airport for Dubai late Sunday. Accompanied by a retinue of aides and officials leaving where he has won a record nine Australian Open titles, including the last three, and could have gone ahead of both Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal in their three-way tie on 20 majors. Trouble began for Djokovic on January 4th when he announced he would be defending his Australia Open title after receiving a vaccination exemption from the Australian government. This led to a backlash from the Australian public who have been under one of the strictest COVID-19 regulations in the world. Hawke on Friday cancelled the Serbs visa on the grounds that Djokovic's presence in the country could fan anti-COVID-19 views and protests. Everton have fired head coach Rafael Benitez in the wake of their 2-1 loss at Norwich on Saturday. The Toffees have decided to make a change in the dugout following their 10th loss of the season. Benitez was initially drafted in to replace Carlo Ancelotti in the Goodison Park hot seat back in June, despite having previously managed Everton's arch rivals Liverpool between 2004 and 2010. The Toffees began the 2021-2022 campaign strongly under the Spaniard, but quickly lost form amid the loss of a number of key players to injuries and positive COVID-19 tests, with a 2-1 defeat to relegation batter Norwich proving to be the last straw for an expectant board. Rennes ended a run of three successive League One defeats by crushing 10-man Bordeaux 6-0 on Sunday to increase the pressure on coach Vladimir Petkovic. Bordeaux have won just three times in 21 league games under Petkovic, who left his job as Switzerland boss after leading the country to the Euro 2020 quarterfinals. Les Girondins have been hit badly by COVID-19 cases, while captain Laurent Koscielny is expected to leave this month after deciding to no longer be in the club's plans. Host Rennes took the lead on 33 minutes through Martin Terrier before Benjamin Bourigon curled home a free kick. All right, there you have it. Adeni Ajishafe coming through with sports updates here on Daybreak. Well, with that, we've come to the end of the show for today. Look, we look forward to having you join us again tomorrow for another time on the program. In case you've missed, you can always catch up on our YouTube. Just go to the YouTube and type Trust TV. It will pop up somewhere there and for you to subscribe. Once you subscribe, you continue to get updates from us. The same goes for other social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Type Trust TV and you'll find us there follow all the instructions and then you get all the updates. Thank you so much for watching the show. My name is Aibelia. Bye for now.